welcome back after the break. Uh, so, we will start off with uh, questions from remote centers. Right now, we have uh, chosen Regency Institute, uh, Pondicherry. If you have a question, please go ahead. Hello, good morning, sir. The function based index? So, yes. so far indices which we have seen uh, support something like if the attribute value equal to 5 or if the attribute value is r dot a is <coughs> between 5 and 17, these are the kinds of queries that an index can answer. But sometimes you want variance. For example, uh, supposing we have uh, stored names in an index, uh, we have uh, kept the names as is with capitalization and Low, small letters, uh, big letters and so forth. Now, if I want to find out uh, everybody with a particular name, how do I use the index on that? Because uh, capital letter is not the same as the small letter. If I do uh, equal to, it will fail. If I want to uh, find the name regardless of whether there is a mix of small or capital letters, how do I use this index? <coughs> One answer is uh, to first store all the names change completely to lower case or to upper case up front before you index and then build a normal index on it. A function index avoids uh, you know this step of having to create an extra attribute and storing it. What it does is it lets you execute a function in this case let us say the two lower or two upper function and the result of that is used for indexing. So, we do not have to create a new column with the uh, result of uh, converting the name to upper case or lower case we directly create a function index on the function uh, upper or lower of uh, the name attribute. Uh, so, that is what a function index is. So, now how do you look up this index? I can uh, say uh, if I have taken a name as input, uh, I can first of all convert that also to upper or lower case as appropriate. Then I can uh, say um, uh, that result is equal to upper of that attribute name. And now the query optimizer knows that there is already an index on upper of attribute name and I am seeing if it is equal to upper of attribute name, it will use that index. Similarly, if I do a join between two attributes, if uh, I do upper of r dot a equal to upper of r dot b, uh, if I want to do, uh, if I want to use an function index, if I built a function index on name for both, for at least one of these relations then an index nested loops join can be used. Uh, even if there are no indices, uh, I can still use merge join. Uh, the only thing is that I have to first uh, compute the function upper of that and then sort on the upper and then I can use merge join. Similarly, I can use hash join by first computing the function upper and then doing the hash join. But it is more general, it does not have to be just upper lower, it could be any function of the attributes of that tuple. So, I hope that uh, answers your question. If you have a follow up question, please go ahead. Okay, sir. Uh, I have one more question on join, sir. Okay. If I want to uh, join tables from uh, data from three tables, how many minimal joins are required? Minimum number of joins are required. Okay. So, the question is if I want to join three different tables, what is the minimum number of join operations required? So, if you use only binary joins and this is the most common situation that um, systems implement only binary joins, then if there are three relations, we need two joins. We, if, supposing the relations are called R1, R2, R3, I can first join R1, R2, then take that and join it with R3 or any of the other join orders, first R2 with uh, R3 and then with R1 and so forth. Uh, there are uh, research papers which talk of multi-way joins. I do not know if anyone has implemented them in an actual uh, system as of now. But potentially, if you have uh, three relations all being joined on the same uh, attribute, meaning the condition is something like r1 dot a equal to r2 dot a equal to r3 dot a, meaning for all three relations, I am equating one attribute from each of these relations to the same value. This kind of thing happens, uh, for example, I have a particular employee and I have uh, multiple uh, relations containing details about that employee. Uh, so, I want to take this employee and look up the details in each of the other relations. This is a good case where I can do a three way join, meaning I do not necessarily materialize the intermediate results. I can take one employee, fetch all the tuples from relation 1, all the tuples from relation 2, all the tuples from relation 3 matching that employee 
So, the query is R join R 1 join R 2 join R 3, where uh, there is an attribute of R 1 which is uh, used to look up the other relations. So, I can look up all those tuples and then uh, combine them uh, at one go and output the result. Instead of creating intermediate results, uh, I can do it all at once. Uh, so, I think for this kind of special case which is uh, used in data warehouses, uh, there are what are called fact tables and dimension tables. So, here the dimension tables are uh, the lookup tables. So, for this special case, I believe many data warehouses do something like this. Uh, but in the general case, I am not sure if anybody implements multi way joins. Any follow up to that? Back to you. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay, thank you. Sir. If I index in a column in a table, if there are any constraints on the table, to drop the index, whether we have to remove constraints or de disable the constraints, or without dropping it, can we drop the index? Okay. So, if you have a um, constraint and an index which is used to support that constraint, uh, will the system allow you to drop the index without dropping the constraint? Um, I think, uh, you know, this is a decision of individual systems. This is not part of the SQL standard. Uh, my suspicion is, uh, I have not tried this out. Uh, but a system which uh, says, look, uh, this person knows what uh, they are doing would allow you to drop it. Even a primary uh, key declaration requires an index. If you drop that index, uh, you know, primary key enforcement is going to become expensive. Uh, so, some system may say, are you sure you want to do this? Some system may say, no, I won't do it. Uh, but other system may say, fine, I trust you know what you are doing and go ahead and do it. Uh, so, the I don't think I can give a standard answer to this question. You can try it out on PostgreSQL and let us know later what happens. Okay, let's take uh, one or two questions from some other centers. We have uh, Sri Shankaracharya in uh, Chhattisgarh, Raipur. Please go ahead. Hi, sir. Good morning. Sir, I have, we have two questions. How P plus 3 is suitable for range query? Okay. Uh, what is the other question, question is, why copy of data is created in internal node during split operations? So, let me answer that uh, question, that is an easier question. If you looked at the B plus tree, uh, you would see that all the data is sorted. So, maybe I can uh, do a screen share and answer this question. Okay. Here is a B plus tree and we want a range operation. So, supposing I want to find all instructors whose names are between Einstein and Sing. So, what I will do is I will traverse this tree down to the very first thing which is Einstein and then I can go along the leaves of this tree and all the instructor names up to the time when I reach Sing or something larger than Sing. So, in this case Sing is present. Uh, supposing Sing were absent, I would find Srinivasan which is alphabetically greater than Sing. So, I will stop at that point. So, uh, I, I may not also find Einstein. Uh, but I will find the first one which is larger than Einstein, supposing Einstein is not there, L size is there and the query range was Einstein to Singh. Both Einstein and Singh are missing. I will find L size and then find all of these until I hit Srinivasan when I know it is, I have gone too far and I will stop. So, that is how a range query is answered. Now, of course, for each of these keys, I will have to find the record ID and find the record as appropriate. Uh, the other part was uh, regarding uh, the split operation, I am not sure what context you are talking about the split operation. If you can elaborate that, I can answer the question. Uh, when we insert more number of data in any node, then during the split operation of that node, the copy of data is uh, created in internal node. So, what kind of benefit we get? Okay. Uh, Fine. So, I was not uh, clear what you meant by split operation earlier. Uh, so, it, in the context of B plus trees, of course, the split operation is when a node is full. Because there is also a split operation in query processing. Um, I thought maybe you were talking of that. Uh, so, coming back here, uh, when you split, you are not creating a copy of the data in internal nodes. The sole purpose of the internal nodes is to act as a guide. The key values in the internal nodes are basically helping you decide which uh, child to follow, which child pointer to follow. Now, you are not creating any copy of data at all. There is no copying of underlying data. All you are doing is storing a key value above. 
and uh, what looked like copying the data is simply uh, you know storing an appropriate key value in an internal node which will help you distinguish between going to uh, the left child or the right child of the split node okay so that's all that is uh, and without that you your b plus tree structure uh, would not uh, be correct because you wouldn't know which one to go to when you're searching you need that information at the internal node so i'm not sure why you have a problem with it uh, are you unhappy with that it's not duplication it's essential for creating a b plus tree sir i have one another question okay hello sir uh, is there any query for a division operation and the answer is no uh, sql used to have this contains operation uh, and i mentioned it earlier when i covered division in the context of sql i talked about the uh, sub query so we, our query was to find out students who had taken all biology courses or equivalently all core courses uh, and there i showed you how to do it in sql by using sub queries with not exists with set difference and i told you there is a construct called contains which makes life easier if if it were available it would have made life easier mm, unfortunately it's not supported in sql today uh, weirdly it was supported in uh, one of the earliest implementation of sql had it later it got dropped and never came back uh, that's the closest that i have seen to construct supporting division uh, but you can think of writing it using that and then translate it to the not exist construct uh, i think in the interest of time uh, let me get back to the uh, query processing slides no more questions right now let me wrap up uh, the outer join operation uh, so the outer join operation can be computed again using sorting or hashing i'm just going to focus on sorting because it's a lot easier with sorting if you want to know how it is done using hashing uh, go read it up from the slides or read it up from the book it's pretty straightforward in that case too so let's do merge join to compute left outer join this is the easiest case what have we done in merging we have uh, two things and we are uh, uh, which are already sorted and we are stepping through those for the join i said that if there is no matching tuple on the other side go to the next tuple but for a left outer join all we have to do is the following if i look at a particular tuple <coughs> tr from r if it does not match any tuple from s output it uh, tr that tuple pad it with nulls and then move on to the next tuple so that's the only change to the merge join algorithm it's a very trivial change in fact uh, earlier we said that if there is no match go to the next tuple <coughs> now we are saying if there is no match for r in the r left outer join s we output it padded with nulls now right outer join is completely symmetric full outer join is also very straightforward uh, for either of the relations if there is no match we will output it padded with nulls to get the full outer join so it's very easy hash join uh, it's again uh, fairly straightforward for left outer join as long as s is the uh, build relation so we are taking an r tuple we probe the build relation and if there is a match we output it if there is no match at all for that r tuple we output it padded with nulls very easy uh, if on the other hand the build relation is r it's still possible but a little bit uh, more complicated not hard at all i'm going to skip the details <coughs> so the last uh, topic in uh, query processing so far we have seen how to evaluate single operations but a query is rarely a single operation it's usually many operations which form a tree so how do you evaluate a full query which is a tree of operations <coughs> essentially there are two alternatives for each part of the tree in some sense one is materialization that is you generate results of an expression and then treat it as a stored relation to op evaluate the next operation an alternative is pipelining where you pass tuples from one operation to the parent operation so let's see this in more detail so here is a mm, query uh, select Uh, building equal to Watson on department, join with instructor, and project on name. Uh, let's say with duplicate elimination. How do you evaluate this? <coughs> One way is to start at the lowermost operation, which is select, run this. How do we do it? We have a choice of using an index, scan, or whatever. Create the output and store it. Now you can think of this expression tree as you snip off this part and replace it by the expression that we just computed. the result that we just computed that's a relation now we have stored it's materialized materialized means 
create it and store it. Now, we do the join operation of that temporary relation with instructor and store it. Then we take the project operator, use that relation as input, run the project operator and store the output to which is the final result. So, this is called materialized evaluation. In general, you can do this uh, bottom up on this tree or a depth first traversal equivalently uh, gives you the same thing. Uh, first visit the first child, materialize it, visit the next child, materialize it, uh, then compute this operator. The alternative is pipelining. So, coming back to the same expression, now supposing I have an index on instructor. Now, I use may be an index or whatever a file scan on department does not matter. I have found departments in the building Watson. Now, instead of storing that relation, we can pipeline it into this join operation. Supposing this is an index nested loops join, it receives one tuple and immediately looks up instructor uh, index on uh, in this case uh, department name and finds matching instructors and pi passes it on. Now, again it does not store it, it passes it on to the project operator which gets out the name. Now, the project operator supposing it is doing duplicate elimination, there are some extra steps here. Maybe it has to sort this to do duplicate elimination. So, what it might do is uh, it takes the tuple uh, and starts creating sorted runs and outputs the sorted runs. Later on, there is another merge operator which computes the final output. So, a duplicate elimination is essentially split into two operators. Uh, the first part computes the sorted runs, the second part does the merge. So, you can pipeline data from any lower operation into the run creation. So, instead of storing the result directly on disk, you pass it straight to the run creation. Run creation keeps aside some amount of memory, it collects tuples till the memory is full, in memory sort output. So, you have pipelined from this join to the run creation. Now, you finish all the runs, after that you have to do the merge and output the uh, final result of duplicate elimination. So, clearly pipelining does not happen between the run creation and the merging step. So, it is best to think of uh, duplicate elimination as two operator uh, or sorting as two operators run generation merging. Now, it is clear that pipelining into run generation is possible, pipelining from run generation to merging is impossible until you have generated all the runs, you cannot merge it. So, you have to materialize the runs and then do the merge later on. I hope that is clear. So, that is pipeline evaluation. Now, pipelining requires coordination. I said this thing generates tuples, it passes on it on to the next, which consumes it. One way to think about it is that each of these operators is running in its own thread and as soon as this generates a tuple, it passes it on to the consumer through some kind of intermediate queue and then that uh, thread is running and as soon as it sees a tuple in its input queue, uh, it processes it. Uh, so, this is conceptually a nice paradigm, uh, but there are a lot of overheads to this because you have to maintain queues, there are two threads of accessing the queue and you have to do synchronization between them. It turns out the cost per tuple of actually processing it is pretty small the synchronization cost starts to dominate with this model. So, it is not widely used. Instead, what is used is one of two things. Uh, it is called uh, demand driven pipelining or producer driven pipelining. So, that is coming up in the next slide. In demand driven or lazy evaluation, this is the thing which is used most frequently. The system, the, there is a query tree. Uh, the tree is actual uh, uh, you know, it is a query plan uh, annotated with the algorithm to be used and so forth. So, that is the tree. On the top node of the tree, the query processing system asks the node saying, please give me the next tuple. Now, that node has not yet created a next tuple to be output, but what it does is it gets the next tuple from its children. So, it will tell its child give me the next tuple and then uh, create a output and return it. Now, in between two calls, each operation has to maintain a state, so it knows what to return next. So, let me illustrate that using the same example. Say so, the first time this thing says give me a tuple and it tells join please give me a tuple. What does join do? It is an index nested loop join let us suppose. 
So, then it will tell its left input, please give me a tuple. What does left input do? Uh, it uses the index and finds the first tuple matching building equal to Watson and returns it. Now, this guy will find the first matching uh, instructor using that department name and return that first matching tuple here to the project operation. When the project operation needs its next input, it will again tell join, give me the next input. Now, the join has to remember that it got a particular department last time from here and maybe it returned only the first instructor in that department. Maybe there are more. So, it may continue the index scan and find the next instructor and return it. So, what has just happened is in between two calls to next on the join, it has to remember where it left off. It has to remember that it was looking at a particular department. It had returned one of the instructors. So, the next call might have to look for the next instructor. If there is no more instructors in that department, it will in turn tell the select operator, give me the next department and then find instructors in that department. At some point, this will say, there are, I do not have any more departments, I am done. Then join will say, okay, I am also done and tell project, no more output and then project will finish up its merge phase and finish. So, that is uh, demand driven pipelining. Producer driven pipelining goes the other way. That is, uh, the best way to think about it is that uh, each of these things is running in parallel and as soon as it has a batch of tuples, it pushes it up to the next operation. The next operation join gets batches of tuples from below and when it has enough tuples, it does whatever join operation required and passes it on. In this case, if it is index nested loops join, uh, it, do, it does not get input from here. It only gets inputs from this one. So, this generates a number of departments in Watson, pushes it here. This guy gets that and does the index lookup on instructor and uh, instructor or department name and pushes the output here and so forth. So, uh, demand driven with the first one we saw is what is used far more often, although producer driven is useful in parallel databases. So, there is some stuff here on how to implement uh, demand driven uh, pipelining. Essentially, there are three methods. This, you, if you are familiar with iterators in Java or newer versions of C++ or C sharp, what does iterator do? You first have to initialize it, uh, iterator.open or get iterator whatever. In this case, uh, it is called open. So, on a particular node, join or select or whatever, you say open. When you call open, it may do some initialization. For example, merge join might sort its relations in preparation for the merge phase. When you call next on that operation, you are saying give me the next tuple. For a file scan, it is easy. It just outputs the next tuple and advances and stores the file pointer. So, the next call again after that will give the next one and so forth. For merge join, uh, it will do the merge. It might have done a partial merge up to now. It finds the next matching tuple in the merge and returns it and so forth. Close shuts down the uh, pipeline and that is it. So, that was a very quick overview of how an entire expression is evaluated. So, what I will do is I will take a couple of minutes for questions uh, and then we will move on to query optimization. So, let us uh, take some live questions. Uh, we have NIT Trichy, please go ahead. How can we fix the maximum number of users for any web application? I interpret this question to mean that if there are more than that many concurrent users, then the system gets into trouble. So, you want to prevent any more users from joining. If that is the question, uh, one way is uh, when somebody attempts to log in, uh, you check how many concurrent users are there. How do you know this? Uh, so, you need to know how many sessions are active. Uh, that uh, is something which, uh, you know, how do you do this? How do you know how many active sessions there are? Mm, I think servlets uh, session should provide uh, some way of finding this. I am not sure. Uh, if it does not, um, you know, when a session times out, uh, it should be possible to say call this function on session timeout. I am not 100 percent sure about this. So, that function could uh, decrement the count of active sessions and then after that, if somebody retries, you allow them in if the number has come down. Um, so, I, I will have to dig into this. The key issue is the session times out automatically. At that point, we have to decrement the count. So, how to do this is something which we need to look into. 
does that answer your question? Over to you. I mean, implemented in Moodle, sir. So 9,000 users can uh, access that uh, AVU software. Sir. So uh, how uh, did you uh, implement that? The number of users. Uh, for Mood, was the question for Moodle or was it for AVU? Over to you. Moodle. Yeah. Uh, so we didn't implement Moodle, and Moodle, uh, to my knowledge, doesn't actually restrict the number of users. Um, it may run out of resources, but it's not counting. And uh, that problem showed up uh, when we did quiz on Moodle. The quiz module is very uh, database intensive, apparently. It's actually, I'm sure it can be rewritten in a much, much more efficient manner. I mentioned uh, optimization through caching. So the quiz module, I think, is dynamically querying the database every time you click next or submit a result, uh, which is a very inefficient way of doing things. Uh, so what it should do is uh, pre-generate uh, the entire quiz for you and uh, send it to you. Uh, so when you do next, it should be a completely local operation. It shouldn't go back to the database. So the number of interactions with the database will come down sharply. Uh, so I'm sure if we do a little bit of rewriting on the quiz module, it can actually handle uh, many thousands of people uh, at a time. Because the server on which our Moodle system is running is pretty high end. I don't know the exact configuration, but I think it has something like uh, 64 gigabytes of memory. You know, it's a lot. It's not disk constrained. Um, it has, uh, you know, a fairly high end uh, CPU uh, with many cores. So it's a pretty robust system. So this kind of stuff should not have happened. Uh, so some amount of tuning, I'm sure, can improve the module a lot. Uh, the other option is to restrict the number of people taking the quiz at a time. So what I was told was break it up into batches of uh, maybe 500 people taking the quiz at a time. But that's a lot of batches that we have. I mean, we have uh, over 5,000 people active who took the quiz at some point of time. That's a lot of batches. Coordinating all that is a pain. So. Uh, you know, I decided not to do it for this course. Uh, it's too much overhead. Uh, I was hoping that uh, Clicker would give us a better solution. In Clicker, the trick is that uh, the answers are collected not all centrally, but your remote centers have something running locally, and that collects your answers. So each remote center is collecting maybe uh, 30, 40, 50, 60 answers, some maybe even as low as 5 or 10. And then they upload it. There are 250 centers. Uh, so they have collected everything together. And now if they upload everything together, it's very efficient. Uh, so that's why uh, the clicker software, even though it uh, is not, uh, you know, it's not, it, it easily handles 1,000 without any problem. That's what we have seen. But I'm pretty sure it would scale to uh, even 10,000 if uh, done if only the clicker software and systems were running at all the remote centers, I'm pretty sure it would work without any performance issues. Does that answer your question? OK, sir. Uh, do we need to specify that number of users in my uh, server program, or uh, it is network dependent? No. the. Uh, none of these things has any uh, direct built-in thing to control the number of users. Uh, so it, essentially, it lets as many users come in, and eventually it will run out of resources, and it becomes very slow, and bad things happen. That's about it. I don't think any of these has a admission control. Conceptually, admission control is a straightforward thing. There are systems which implement it, but to the best of my knowledge, uh, Moodle does not implement it. And uh, you have to do a bunch of work to make it happen. So let's move to some other question. I, I would like questions on today's topics, preferably. Okay, we have NRI Institute, uh, Bhopal. Please. Yes, sir. Uh, good morning, sir. So my, my question is regarding JDBC session, hmm. and uh, I want to ask that with a single object of connectionless class. Sorry. Uh, with single object of connection class, is it possible to make multiple connections on multiple databases? Uh, no. So if you want uh, multiple connections, you have to create multiple connection objects. So you have a driver manager dot, uh, uh, you know, get connection. So you have to make 
uh, get separate connections. Uh, you could make probably two different connections to the same database. I think that is allowed. Uh, not just think. I know it's allowed. We have used it. Uh, so you can make separate connections to a database. Uh, but on a single connection, you can only be doing one thing at a time. If you executed a query, uh, it has to complete before you can do anything more. Does that answer your question? Means, uh, it is not possible to make multiple connections. You can make uh, multiple connections. That's not a problem. You can make multiple connections to different databases or even to the same database if you want. But per connection, you should have only one thing active at a time. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, there are some extensions question. of, uh, yeah, before you ask the question, there are some extensions which have been uh, proposed which allow asynchronous submission. So you can submit multiple queries and then uh, whenever they finish, you, know, you get the results back. Uh, I don't think this is uh, still part of the JDBC standard, uh, but maybe it will appear, it will appear sooner rather than later, I think. Good morning, sir. My question is, sir, please explain advantage and disadvantage of DSN connection. Uh, so that's just a lower level implementation. Uh, you, you, this is a data source, right, uh, which you create and then do that. That's a, I think it, it's a Microsoft specific thing, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but I, I, you know, I don't know much about that. I don't have anything to say about it. Any other question? Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, my question is from JDBC section. What is connection pooling? Okay. Connection pooling is something which everyone should be aware of. Uh, what connection pooling does is, uh, you, when you open a connection, there is a lot of overhead to opening it. There is a password which is passed, the verification, handshaking, and there is a lot of stuff that happens to open a connection. Now, supposing you have 10,000 users using the system, right? One after another, the requests are coming. Now, supposing for every request that comes, every request on a servlet, I open a connection, process the request, close the connection. There is a lot of overhead. So, what connection pooling does is, instead of closing the connection, I put it aside in a pool of connections, which are currently unused. So, when a new request comes, uh, what I do is, instead of opening a brand new connection, I pick up from this pool of unused connections. So, there would be multiple connections to the same database in this case. So, there is a pool of them. So, I will just pick up a connection from this pool, uh, which are currently not in use, and use it to send my query and get the result back. When I am done with it, I meaning, let us say one servlet. The servlet is processing a request. When that servlet is done, it does not close the connection, it returns it to the pool. Uh, so, this has a very significant uh, impact on performance. Um, so, there are many uh, cases where the database interaction is very small, it is just one small lookup in the database that may be actually cached in the buffer. So, it is very fast at the database end and uh, opening the connection is actually the big bottleneck and connection pooling can give you, you know, many factors of improvement in performance. Four or five times improvement is not uncommon. Sir, uh, how many connections can we put in connection pool? Uh, yeah. That is under uh, the control. So, you need a library which handles connection pooling. And uh, some uh, servers, I think Tomcat uh, supports uh, connection pooling internally. Uh, so, if you uh, use uh, the right APIs, uh, you just say open the connection and uh, instead of closing it, you release the connection. Uh, so, you can look up the API for connection pooling and uh, use that. Or you can build your own if you wish. Um, although today it is available, so why would you build your own? Use existing connection pooling libraries, either directly from the uh, servlet engine like Tomcat or there are other libraries which you can download and use. Uh, so, that limit is up to you. Uh, it depends on how many connections the database can handle simultaneously. Uh, so, uh, you do not want to open 1000 connections to a database ideally. So, maybe the connection pool would not be that big, but beyond that it is a function of performance. There is no uh, other limit to it. Okay, I think we should get back to uh, query processing related questions, if you do not mind. Uh, others, uh, please stick to query processing questions. Uh, we have uh, SIES uh, Navi Mumbai, please go ahead. My question is based on sequential, for sequential file organization. My question is, what is an overflow block used even if there is at a given point 
only one overflow record okay so this is again not related to query processing uh, so uh, but i'll answer it very quickly since you've asked it but i won't answer any more questions like this uh, so the answer there is that uh, you have to store data only in units of blocks in a database even if you want to store one record you have to store it somewhere and that unit is a block okay you are only going to get a uh, 3 bhk here you are not going to get uh, you know one room uh, kitchen to store your one record all things are the same size so you can put many people in that uh, 3 bhk uh, but you can't get a separate record by itself and uh, let's move on to any other query processing related question what i'll do is now i'll take one or two questions from chat i'll answer them and then we'll move on to query optimization um there's another question about query processing on multiple sites uh so here how do you run a query which accesses data from multiple sites so that's a good question uh so the answer to that is uh, typically that you will break up the query processing into parts that are done in different sites in the simplest case uh, all the processing is done at one site and the other sites merely send data over to this central site so example if i'm doing r join s where s is on one site r is on another site i will ship um, s uh, the entire contents of s to one of the sites uh, which contains r and then do the join locally there or i can do it the other way uh, but in general uh, you might do something more if there were selections on s maybe i will apply the selection condition on s and only ship the relevant tuple and then if there were uh, join condition between r and s if s is very large r is very small i might uh, send the r tuples to s and then uh, do the join there get the join results back to the original site maybe where r was present uh, that's more efficient than sending s over so there are many alternatives for uh, doing queries across multiple sites uh, this is part of uh, distributed query processing and there have been optimizers built for optimization in this context anyway optimization is coming up next Uh, but the key point here is that uh, there is one extra operator uh, which is uh, sometimes referred to as the data exchange operator the exchange operator ships data from one place to another now in the context of uh, parallel processing the uh, issues are somewhat similar except that now you are running a single operator on many many different nodes in a machine uh, so what is a machine here maybe it's a bunch of uh, computers which are linked by a network and i want to break up an operation such as a join or uh, uh, the sorting operation or aggregation based on sorting and so forth hashing i want to divide it up and do it uh, do parts of each of these on each of the nodes in a highly parallel system so i will uh, come back to this when we cover big data which was supposed to be today but i don't know if we'll have time for it uh, what i want to say here is that parallel uh, processing is eminently possible uh, but the key step over here is to be able to move data between one uh, machine to another uh, so that it's available where it is required so there is again an operator which does this called the exchange operator so how you uh, run parallel query plans is actually uh, very nice so th there are two uh, parts in any planning there's one of the steps is the data exchange step which ships data between different nodes how to do this we'll see later then you do uh, the same plan in parallel at each site using only local data so you have moved all the data that you need to each of the nodes you do part of the query plan then the results might again be redistributed to different nodes uh, that's again another exchange operator then again you run the uh, queries locally the same plan runs at each site but only accessing whatever is data is already available at that site and so forth so you have alternating steps uh, where uh, things are running locally with no exchange of information and then in the other step in, uh, data is exchanged between sites with no local processing so if you alternate this you get a query pl uh, plan and that can be represented itself as a tree where the tree has ordinary nodes it also has this uh, exchange operator which is the thing which exchanges data between nodes uh, so that's uh, how parallel processing is done using conceptually the same kind of query plan still a tree everything is more or less the same but it can be easily extended to parallelize so let's uh, 
let me answer one last question. It says, can indexing of tables be done on picture data types? Now, a picture data type is just a binary object. There is no way you can meaningfully build an index directly on a binary object. But if you do some uh, processing on the image and come up with some features there, you could index on those features. Uh, for example, um, I think uh, many websites today offer uh, face recognition on photos. Uh, so if it's a circle of friends, uh, they might uh, do face recognition amongst your friends on that. So they've actually processed the picture and done face recognition. So you might actually index the picture on the people who are present in that picture. Uh, so it is possible to do such things, uh, but it must be done after some feature extraction from the picture.